this is Tom, a.k.a. Jerry here for Tabletop Tap Room and Star Frontiers Gamer. And we have another Fanzine Friday, number 39, I do believe, which means we are looking at Frontier Explorer number 14. Now, uh, this is from the fall of 2015. And um, I was actually on the road quite a bit, and I told Tom Stevens that I was... I was going to be stepping back from the magazine, which wasn't ended up not being true at all. I, I just couldn't stay away. Uh, but I do have less of a fingerprint on this particular issue. The cover, and this is a gorgeous cover. I absolutely love this cover. The uh, background image is from NASA, which is public domain. And the uh, front ground image, this is the model done by Jay Thurman on a deviant art of the uh, Eleanor Mores exploration scout ship and uh, tom stevens uh did the photoshopping of putting the uh putting the image together for the cover and it's 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 simple but it's gorgeous all right that is a sexy space scene and i love it um the quote on here is an everlasting itch for things remote now uh that for the literary uh, O'Files is a quote from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. The full quote is, as for me, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. Uh, I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. And that was a great quote, uh, especially when you have an exploration ship uh, image going on. <clears throat> so first up is, and, and by the way, I just want to say, I had been a dominant force in the magazine up to this point, but uh, I was spending a lot of time on the road between two different states uh, in 2015. And uh, so I really had to scale back my activities at the magazine and a lot of people stepped up. And I just want to say that's what's great about our community. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I love uh, our Star Frontiers community and how people stepped up and they just said, yeah, I can write something. I'll, you know, I'll write something. I'll submit something. And, uh, and so we have great fans out there. And I just want to encourage you, uh, now that the Star Frontiersman Volume 2 is kicking off, please do consider writing something and submitting it to the magazine. We are going to be hungry for content. Uh, I will, um, you know, if, if I've got to write a whole magazine, I will. Uh, but I don't want my name, I don't have an ego trip going where my name has to be all over the magazine. So I do want to encourage you, if you've got an idea for a starship, uh, if you've got an idea for a piece of equipment, for an adventure, please write something up and submit it uh, to the uh, Frontier, uh, to, excuse me, to the Star Frontiersman Volume 2. Uh, so moving right along, uh, we have Ed, uh, Edwin uh, Centron wrote Space Clans. Now, Space Clans is uh, a group of families that just live and work in space. They've, they've uh, shunned going planet side, and their whole existence is mining, living on stations, living in ships. And so this was an interesting idea, and it was something that really needed to be tackled in the setting, I thought. And so you, you get some new equipment here. And um, some organization, the Neon Fleet, the Truth Seekers cult. And so this is just a nice piece of just background idea to give you a plot hook uh, for, a, uh, for an adventure. Then next up was my friend Jurak and Fat Max. And this is by Eric Windsor. It's another one of his ecology uh, uh, articles. We had some great um, artwork from uh, Scott Mulder, a.k.a. AZ Gamer, and uh, of the Sea Dragon. And so this is the uh, Sea Dragon of New Pale. And there's just over and over again, we got some, there was great art to uh, go throughout the article, and then the stats and GM notes. And just another great addition to the, uh, to the ecosphere of uh, the Star Frontiers, just another great ecology of article. Uh, the Artificers. Uh, this was a conversion by Laura Mama, and this was a void race for Star Frontiers. It's kind of inspired by, um, if you remember the original Battlestar Galactica uh, series, 
they had a few episodes where they encountered these like advanced alien species, almost angelic, and they had some sort of uh, interdimensional city station ship that would, you know, and when and when the um, the warriors from the Battlestar came back from that, uh, their ships were completely white, their uniforms were completely white from that experience, and it's it's almost kind of like that so it's it's like a very magical type of uh, addition to the setting and uh, very advanced technology and interdim interdimensional space it was not my cup of tea so i never really dug into it too deeply to use it uh it was just not a storyline i was interested in going but it's there she's done the groundwork if you're interested in that kind of thing uh, opening act. Um, this is Scott Holiday, and it is a one-page piece of fiction. So it's a great little frontier story, and it gets to the point right away. And then Ion en Engines by uh, Edwin Cintron. He's done another. Um, he's not another, another review of the Ion Engine, tinkering with the rules for it a little bit, and gives you some. Uh, some uh, you've got stats here for a, a pirate stealth cra uh, craft, which I thought was interesting. And then finally, we, <laughs> we get an offering from me it's the Aremus shuttle and Romulus runabout. Now, what's interesting here is I actually did two deck plans this one is the Remus class shuttle, and the Romulus this has got the chem drive, this is just short legged shuttle planet to moon, planet to next next orbit, you know, just a, a you know, AU, 1 AU, uh, 1.5 AU distance. So short-legged runs with the Remus shuttle. The uh, Romulus class runabout, there was another deck plan, and somehow it didn't make it into the uh, magazine. Uh, and I found it uh, a couple of years ago uh, on a computer uh, in, in some files, and, and i I'd have to look to lay my hands on it, but there is that Romulus, and all that is is the is ion engines were put on it. So it's now a runabout for really running about. So if you want to do, you know, say a three AU uh, journey within a solar system, the uh, Romulus uh, runabout would be better for that. You could conceivably do a void jump and do an interstellar journey with it. But it's not going to be comfortable. But it, you know, you can see from the size of the ship that it's uh, it's a, just a great ride for running around a star system. If if the player characters absolutely had to make a void jump, they could do it with this ship. But again, it's not going to be comfortable for them. Um, but it it is a ride for just you know bebopping around a solar system, and that's how it was intended. And so you get the you get all the stats. That's followed by a one-page uh, Scarecrow bot. Now, the Scarecrow bot, in light of the fact that I was on the road and sometimes literally writing these, art these kind of articles uh, on the smartphone with just two thumbs uh, in a Dunkin' Donuts, uh, <laughs> it's short. But it is just uh, a... Uh, it's a comprehensive review of this one new class of robot, which is for small critter abolishment, removal and eradication, crop regulating, overwatch robot or scarecrow bot. Um, so this is a service robot that patrols uh, agricultural fields. And if there is a, uh, a, a vermin that uh, is doing a pre a predation on the crops, the robot's job is to get rid of it um, with extreme, <laughs> extreme measures, i.e. it's armed and it shoots critters. Um, now, now that might be, you might be like, geez, that's a little bit harsh. Well, the point was, is that I, I not only designed the robot and statted it out completely and gave it some options for weapons, but I did, I wrote the programming. You got the standard programming with the mission and the functions, but then we get into common malfunctions. And for some reason on this particular robot, the second function has been known to become corrupt. 
There are several instances where the robot identified any size creature as a pest, including medium-sized sapient beings like humans, Drolocytes, Caesareans, and Versk. Uh, with lawsuits pending, Tacton Instruments refuses to comment on this uh, on this at this time. <laughs> and then I wrote in a counter. So it's it's uh, it's a little bit of fluff for the setting because ag agricultural worlds like Rupert's Hole, um, oh New Pale, definitely New Pale, you know, are, would use this scarecrow bot. But if the you know there's an option there for it to be a problem for the player characters. And or maybe they're infiltrating a plantation and uh, they, you know, remove the security lock and shut down a robot. And then the roboticist in the party reprograms it a little bit uh, because this robot is designed to hunt and, and attack people. So you can modify the programming just a little bit. You can then manipulate this robot to your purposes as a player. But it's also there for some game master fiat of, oh, geez, you encounter scare. Oh, and too bad. It had that common um, that common malfunction where the <laughs> it now is identifying you as a pest that must be eradicated. <laughs> so um, it's just it's a fun little thing you can throw into your game. And uh, and I went to, I went the extra mile of doing the programming for you and writing in plot hooks as well. And then limp softly and carry a big stick. Now, I believe this is the very first time this character of Hezrid Wolfen Ars Clan shows up. He is a Yazarian mercenary who ends up taking a job with a Capellan free merchant with the title of cargo handler. He's hired on, but very quickly becomes the head of security for the ship. And uh, so uh, I started doing these short little you know it's it's like like five six paragraphs of fiction introducing Hezrid but it's also introducing new equipment and so this is the beginning of my in the Minzy marketplace series of articles that are just quick short little articles that introduce new equipment and I I'm taking the time to specify that because um, there's some news happening Hezrid Wolfen ours clan has been promoted in the Star Frontiersman Volume 2, he is back introducing new equipment, but he's back. He's been promoted. He has now been promoted to be a captain, a Capellan Free Merchant captain, and he has himself a uh, an elite, fast, little courier-type uh, transport. Does small cargoes, usually high-priority cargoes, and uh, and so he is uh, he is going to be uh, turning up in the pages of the Star Frontiersman Volume Two, which is coming out here in January. So you will see him again. But this is the very first piece of fiction uh, that I wrote, including this character. And uh, it's just a little simple setup to introduce uh, sword canes and uh, walking stick pole arms. And basically, these were a concealed weapon. The sword's concealed in the cane, which is cool. We see that in movies, and I just thought, you got to have that in Star Frontiers. And then the walking stick pole arm, you, you, you push a button and turn the thing, and it forces the blade to pop out. Now you've got a pole arm, which is not a bad melee weapon uh, in, in Star Frontiers for the stats. So uh, here's this article. I've always loved this, um, this piece of art. I don't know who drew it. Uh, but uh, just always, for me, this is always, uh, I love using this uh, as my portrait for any Yazarian I'm, uh, I'm playing, whether it's a Yazarian priest, or in this case, it happens to be this Yazarian enforcer. And then uh, more Titan Rising from Scott Mulder, uh, the cartoon. And uh, this was a, a tutorial I wrote when I was back here in Maine, in 2015, I, I did it on the quick on my day off, and it's uh, for making gas giants for your Nighthawks game with miniatures. Now, if you look at this first picture here, the, these are very obviously half spheres, three inch half spheres I bought at the craft store, Hobby Lobby, Michaels, so on and so forth. And I went out and got a little 45 record and with the three-inch half spheres. It makes a great looking gas giant, but I do not recommend doing it like I did here uh, in this bottom corner because these are a little tippy. 
They just want to tip over. I actually uh, developed this type where I've cut the uh, half sphere on a diagonal. And, and then I've scored a 45 um, record and snapped it. Now, if you score them, you, you really got to heavily score them. You can get a good straight snap uh, on them on a, on a nice hard edge. Uh, but if that doesn't work, you can cut them with the cutting wheel of a, you know, on a Dremel and get a nice straight cut if you if you have to go that way. I did the heavy scoring and then snapped them. And I, I do believe I, I wasted one with a bad snap. But, uh, you know, you can pick up these these old records at like a, a Goodwill for very, extremely, very short money. And uh, so I did a couple here. You can see them in this picture. These are just the three inch half spheres and they work very well with the 45 to simulate the uh, dust rings, you know, around a gas giant. And basically I use, um, I use this as, as terrain on the Nighthawks, you know, on the board game for the uh, ship to ship combat. Uh, because it just adds a little bit of blocking terrain. You can't fly through the planet. You can fly through the dust ring. Uh, and But any shooting through the dust ring has got like a negative 10. You know, and you could change it for different scenarios. It could be just, well, for one d d gas giant, this one it just happens to be minus 10% for any shooting through the ring. Another time it could be minus 20. You know, and so it, it becomes a nice terrain feature that's you don't normally get in the Nighthawks game. And I love terrain. I love terrain that forces better tactics uh, or, you know, gives a, gives you a chance at getting the drop on the enemy because you've used good tactics and you've used the terrain. Now uh, I wanted to see how far I could push it. And the largest half sphere at the time available at Hobby Lobby was this eight inch. It's actually hollow. And uh, so I did a string to get a nice straight line, and then I did a cut, and I went out and got the full size final record, did a score and a, and a snap, and uh, put this together as a even bigger, something approaching, you know, Neptune size in our solar system. And uh, so uh, again, so I went even bigger, and I and again I fully recommend using using this style over this particular style. Um, because you, you're playing in two dimensions anyways, you might as well just, it's very obvious who's being blocked by the planet. And it's very obvious if shooting is going through that dust ring by any of the ships. So that's just a quick, simple tutorial, uh, that I put in uh, called got gas giants. And next up, we have the Astro Horizon. And uh, I love Scott for doing this because we wanted to diversify and it became even more important to us after uh, 2018. But Scott Mulder did this uh, Astro Horizon. It's a new Starliner design for Goblinoid Games, Starships, and Spacemen 2nd Edition RPG. And uh, so, so this is not really a great starship for uh, um, Star Frontiers because it's a horizontal deck plan. And you can see he's done a really thorough uh, write-up on this ship. We're scrolling down. You've got images. He did all this artwork for this. And then we get down to the, um, the deck plan. And as you can see, this is very much a traveler-style deck plan. So not only is it for uh, starships and spacemen, it's also very handy. You could totally use this for traveler. So, very extensive. Conversions, creature conversions. Uh, Laura Mama did these, uh, she likes uh, Gamma World, and she did these conversions of these uh, Gamma World creatures uh, for Star Frontiers, which I, you know, totally endorse. And I love the Greater Arn because it's got that bug-like look. And so it was a natural thing for us to say, you know, um, Planet of Origin was the Verse Home World. So you get some Verse Home World creatures in the Arn, and the greater Arn, and the greater Arn turns out to be big enough to be a flying mount, which is kind of cool. And then we get this uh, lurker above as she converted, and then we get uh, Pax, Paxic the Puncher. 
Chris Turney wrote this piece of fiction, but this is my um, this is my illustration here, because I was sitting there one day thinking about a drawlocyte with maxed out dexterity. Maxed out dexterity of 100 dexterity would allow him to generate 10 limbs, five arms, five legs, which would then in turn allow him to make five punches in a melee combat. And if he had invested, and he probably would have, in some martial arts skill, a few levels, combined with that, ma <laughs> that massive um, dexterity and a few levels of... Uh, of martial arts skill and and we're you know we're on 100 dexterity that's going to contribute a 50 to his to his to hit chance and let's say uh three levels of martial arts skill so he's going to have an 80 percent chance of hitting with a punch on an 80 percent chance he's got an expanded knockout range um that's that's kind of impressive so you're making five combat rolls um Throwing a punch, punches don't do a lot of damage, uh, but what you're really looking for is that knockout. And so this guy is going to be a one-hit wonder. He, he's going to wade into a melee, throw one punch, and knock NPCs out left and right. That's what he's all about. And so that's why I did the drawing, but then, um, you know, so this drawing was laying around, and then the story came along, and I was like, oh, <laughs> let's just... Let's just use this draw a site picture for that. Um, and you know, we've got another cyberpunk boxer here uh, by uh, ZG Fisher. And so you get a nice frontier flavored uh, piece of fiction in this one. And then yet again, this is Edwin Cintron. He's the guy who did the Love and Atomic Rockets uh, fiction. That was so good. So good. This is another character from that whole storylines that he's been doing of um this is uh isabella shimout um like the grandmother of the clan and so this is her story and it goes back in time and it centers on and it's actually just a short i believe just two pages two page fiction it centers on a historic event early in the timeline and and uh so this i won't spoil it you can read it yourself, and but it's another one of those a love and atomic rockets uh, stories by Edwin. So, and then we get the uh, Grimm's Guide at the end. And again, like I don't have much of a fingerprint on this issue, but I couldn't, I just couldn't stay away. I would, I would be in a Dunkin' Donuts taking a break with a coffee on the smartphone, just <laughs> typing out one, one or two page articles with the old thumbs. And then trying to edit it on that little tiny screen and submit it. Uh, it, it was a crazy time, 2015, for me. But uh, I still, I still kept my hand in the magazine. But plenty of other people stepped up, and uh, really appreciated them doing that. And uh, fantastic, fantastic magazine, fantastic cover. So uh, another good one. So this is Tom for Tabletop Taproom and Star Frontiers Gamer with another Fanzine Friday. And uh, if you've not already subscribed, please do consider hitting the like, subscribe, and bell icon to help me build the channel. And I will see you in the frontier.